Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be diving into one of the most important topics in investing, which is performance ratios. Whatever you're evaluating, be it crypto or uh, a high bid asset like uh, Nasdaq or Apple, anything, it's very important to know how you're going to measure this. There's no single best one. They all tell a different story. We're going to be talking about the six major ones, Sharp, Sortino, Omega, Information Ratio, Martin, and Calmar. Um, by the end of this, you should probably know what to do, what to do in which situation and have a good introduction to them. So let's dive in. Don't forget to join the Discord, check out my school, look at the rest of the channel, etc. Uh, and metrics, the Sharp Ratio. Introduced by William Sharp in 1966, this is probably the most widely used risk-adjusted return metric in the industry. The formula is very straightforward. Sharp returns equals the return of your investment minus the risk-free rate. Divided by the standard deviation of those returns, essentially it's asking how much ex excess return am I getting for each unit of risk I'm taking. Here's an example. Say your portfolio returned 10% over a year. The risk-free rate, let's say treasury bonds was 2% and your standard deviation was 12. Your sharp ratio would be 0.67. A higher number obviously is better. The strength, it's simple, universally understood and widely available. Every major platform calculates it. The weakness, and this is important, it treats all volatility equally. It doesn't distinguish between upside volatility, those happy surprises when your portfolio jumps up, and down downside volatility, which hurts. It also assumes returns are normally distributed, which they rarely are in real markets. The next one is the Sortino ratio, developed by Frank Sortino in 1994. Think of this as Sharp's smarter cousin. The formula is similar but with one critical difference. Instead of dividing by total volatility, you only divide by downside deviation. Downside deviation only me measures volatility when returns fall below a, below a target, typically zero or the risk-free rate. Why does this matter? Because investors care about losses than gains. A strategy that swings wildly upward and gently downward should look better than one with equal volatility in both directions. The Sortino ratio captures this. Using our previous example, if that 12% standard deviation came equally from ups and downs, but the downside deviation was only 7%, your Sortino would be about 1.14. Higher than the sharp, this is no accident. It rewards strategies that deliver positive skew, meaning more upside surprises than downside. The strength, it focuses on what actually hurts, downside risk. It's particularly particularly useful for evaluating hedge funds, assets, or anything to design and minimize losses of them, let's say in a grid search. The weakness, it requires more detailed data and can be calculated differently depending on how you define your target return. It's also less standardized than a sharp. Now let's talk about the omega ratio, a less famous but increasingly popular metric that tells a richer story. The omega ratio is essentially the probability weighted ratio of gains versus losses above a threshold. If you set your threshold at zero, it's asking, what's the ratio of time my investment is above zero to time it's below? But here's what makes Omega special. It encapsulates multiple aspects of performance. A high Omega means not only do you have more upside moves, but they're larger and you have fewer downside moves or they're smaller. The, beautiful, the beauty here is the flexibility. You can set any threshold you want. Maybe your required return is 5% annually and an Omega would tell you whether the investment is likely to exceed that target. The strength it's comprehensive. Incompar incorporating both the probability and magnitude of outcomes, it handles non-normal distributions better than Sharp. The weakness? Most investors don't know what Omega is. It's rarely provided on standard platforms and you'll likely need to calculate it yourself or use some specialized software. Let's shift gears now. The inform information ratio is different because it's not about absolute performance. It's about relative performance. Here's the setup. You have a benchmark like the S&P 500. Your job is to beat the benchmark and the information ratio measures how consistent that outperformance is. The formula, the return of your investment minus the benchmark return. 
divided by the tracking error. Tracking error is the volatility of the difference between your returns and the benchmark. Say your fund returned 12% while the S&P 500 returned 10%, that's a 2% outperformance. But if your tracking error, how much that outperformance fluctuates is 4%, let's say, your information, your information ratio is 0.5. If that same outperformance had zero tracking error, the ratio would be infinite, indicating consistent repeatable skill. The strength is specifically designed for evaluating active managers. If you're paying someone to beat the market, this is your scorecard. The weakness, it only matters if you're comparing to a benchmark. It can also be gamed. Managers with low tracking error are rewarded even if they're just closet indexing with a small active bet. The Martin ratio is something of a hidden gem in performance measurement. It's less common than the others, but also addresses a specific problem, how an investment recovers from losses. Here's the concept. The annualized return divided by the maximum drawdown. A drawdown is the decline from a peak to a true. Think of pandemic crash in 2020. That was a massive drawdown. The Martin ratio essentially asks, for every dollar I lost in my worst drawdown, how many dollars did I earn annually? A higher ratio would mean a better recovery efficiency. The strength, it focuses on drawdown resilience, which matters deeply to real investors. It forces you to think about till risks, till risk and recovery, not just average volatility. But the weakness, it only considers the single worst drawdown. If you had two terrible periods, only the worst counts. And a strategy with one great year could have outsized, could have an outsized ratio, even if it typically underperforms. Finally, the Calmar ratio. Introduced in 1991, it's a close cousin to Martin, but slightly different in focus. The Calmar ratio is the annualized return divided by divided by the maximum drawdown over a specific period, typically three years. Some versions use a three-year window. The key difference from Martin, Kalmar specifically looks at a defined time frame. This makes it more comparable across different time periods and strategies. You're always comparing apples to apples. So if a fund returned 15% annualized over three years with a maximum drawdown of 20%, its Kalmar would be 0.75. The strength here, the fixed time frame make, makes it standardized and comparable. It's excellent for, for evaluating recovery potential during stress periods. The weakness, the three-year window is arbitrary. Markets move in different cycles, so sometimes this window captures your worst losses, sometimes not. And like Martin, it's focused on one specific drawdown. So which ratio should you use? Here's my framework. 